Okay, Anna, so let's start with this work here. So do you want to tell me a little bit about what, what it is we're looking at? We're looking at a few concrete poems that I wrote, composed, typed in the 60s, 67 or so, I think. So these are like highly structured, very graphical poems. And already I can start to see some of the influences maybe that appeared later on. We've got a sort of Mondrian style. Obviously I was interested in Pierre Mondrian at the mm -hmm. time. Okay. And these were, these were literally typed up on a typewriter? Literally typed on a typewriter. You can't really do them on a computer. Yeah. Because they involve over typing and various kind of things that you can only do with a physical so typewriter. We're, yeah, we're, so we're starting with work from what you say, 1967? Seven, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's wander over here. And this piece, which... So this is a piece called 19, mm -hmm. which I made between 1968 and 1969, it was made when I had decided to stop making works like each of these squares, which were kind of abstracted from reality in various ways, landscape and so on. Um, and I decided to make a sort of summing up work of what I had been doing in the previous years. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that having made 20 pieces, I then tried to arrange them in a single work, and I couldn't do it to my satisfaction. And what I worked out was that I could write a computer program and write into the computer program the rules that I wanted to be followed in the arrangement, what I did want next to one another, what I didn't want near to one another, and things like that, and have the computer program run and work out the arrangement. This I did using the one computer that Leicester Polytechnic had at the time. Uh, in fact, I think it was called uh, Leicester College of Technology then, before Leicester Polytechnic. Uh, the computer would have fitted fairly easily into this gallery, but it was that kind of science. <laughs> and so this piece is arranged by computer? Yes. Yeah. And in terms of rules, what is it arranging and how is it arranging? It's them? arranging... Um, proximity issues really so the rules that I wanted it was a, the, like the question was I wanted certain rules to be followed like this should be on the same row or on a different row this should be on a different column this should not be next to one another and things like this and so I worked out the rules that I wanted aesthetically to follow that I was trying to follow and uh, built those into a computer program the actual truth of the story to be honest about it, is that the three hours that I was allowed to use this one computer uh, uh, was I used up, and the computer program ran very well, but because I was sensible, I got it to print out near solutions, and in fact, after three hours, it had not found the solution. But it, what, what it did find was a solution which was almost correct, and I could see how by one little manoeuvre I could turn that into a complete... So a bit of a collaboration solution. between you so, and the computer. So in a way yeah. this was the first of my collaborations between yeah. computer and human. So each tile is, in co is coded in some way? Yes, exactly. And then the algorithm sorts the components, places the components according to an aesthetic principle, a rule that yeah, you come up with? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and the realisation from this was twofold really. One was that you could use a computer to handle these rules. And the other was how important these rules were underlying my art. Mm. And so I became interested not just in the use of the computer but in the use of the rules, mm -hmm. which got me concerned with what was known at the time, anyway, as systems art. Yeah. And so we're saying 68, 69 for yep. this piece? Okay. Yes. So very early use of computers in the production of the work. And then if we move on to the well, pieces... Do you want to come back to oh, yes. these okay. pieces? Because then I think the next things mm. were where I got involved in thinking about the computer for interaction. Mm. And um, well, there were various things that are not in the exhibition, but here's one that is in the exhibition, which is something called Communications Game, which was a very kind of... Uh, 
low bandwidth way in which three people, or in other versions of it, six people, could kind of communicate with one another by flicking switches and changing lights. Not knowing exactly what was going on, but somehow finding out by experimenting amongst themselves a way of communicating. What I found when this was mounted in this particular exhibition was that some grown-up groups trying to use it, have had it were quite, found it quite difficult. But some kids, I'm talking around the age of six or seven, really got involved in it and handled it quite well and managed to communicate with one another quite well. So it's quite interesting, the openness of the thinking of the children somehow. Yeah. And were they communicate? were they talking through the screens to each other? Well, they were shouting at one another. Yeah. So I know, I know a little bit about the, the internal operation of this piece and it's three systems based on logic tables. So there's no randomness and there's no um, complexity within the logic. The logic is, is fixed, if you like. Yeah. The complexity emerges from the fact that there are three systems and they're, they're mixed up, if you like. So the system is completely deterministic, but if you're using it, you get the sense that maybe there's something going on and you're trying to find the rules is it deterministic? Is it random? Is it? Um, are there other things going on? And that's a very good uh, summary. And if you look, look at the rest of my work and the rest of my use of interaction from that day to today, what you've just said still applies. Mm. So I don't use randomness. It's all deterministic. But uh, basically, the interactive systems are open systems. So the unexpected events occur because of things happening in the world rather than because of the use of random numbers. Yes, that's which is very good. <laughs> and at, at about the same time, I made this piece, which is interactive. It's a rearrangeable, right? But it, it's, not, it's not using computers or anything, but I can change it by changing these pieces, moving them around. It's called jigsaw, and it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Alternatively, you could think of it as a rearrangeable artwork. Mm -hmm. So that uh, if you have it on your dining room table, each day you could make it different. So within this, there, there are clear boundaries to what is possible. Yes. But within those, those, those boundaries, there's a huge amount of variation. Yes. And it's up to you as the, the viewer or interactor to explore that variation, those combinations. Exactly. Mm. So part of the point of this as with all interactive work really, is that part of the creative process is handed over to the participant. Mm. So the artist sets up the system, if you like, and leaves some of the creative joy to the audience, to the participant. Yeah, and you have set up the boundaries. There, you know, yeah, of course. You can't make it all yellow because there isn't en enough to make exactly. it all yellow and that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's, it's systematised. You might say. Yeah. And are we looking at sort of similar time period here? Yeah, this was done like, in 1970. 1970, oh, yeah. And who would you say, in, well, in art, in art terms, who would you say are the influences? Who are you looking at maybe at this time? Well, two things really. I, of course, I was looking at the constructivist tradition artists through to De Steele, our house. So Malevich, Mondrian, Max Bell all these people. Uh, but also I was looking at people who were concerned with interaction, the people doing uh, happenings mm. and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. And this will be, in fact the work we've looked at so far, is around about the time of cybernetic serendipity. Yes indeed, so that was also, yes indeed, so that was also influential in the sense of uh, making it okay, <laughs> at least in a funny context. Mm. Um, to do all this strange stuff using computers, new technology and whatnot. Yeah, and you went to that exhibition? Of course, yes I did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, where should we on the next? Shall we carry, shall we on, go over carry here? on back yeah. where we were here? Because I think it's very interesting to see that what I did here is this is in the 70s and I was making paintings, these are like reliefs, oh, yeah. using sprayed cellulose. Um, Without going into grim detail about them, the point is that they, they are organised in two respects. One is that they're using geometrical 
equal structures to say what goes where, where the yellow is, and where a square is, and whatever. And secondly, I was determining process. So, like, in what order things should be done. So that I was constraining my art by systematizing it geometrically and also systematizing the process that I used in making it. Which sounds very restrictive, but it was restrictive in a way that gave me enormous freedom. Because the blank canvas with 24 pots of paint and 50 brushes is something which doesn't offer you freedom. It offers you almost like a paralysis of not knowing what to do. Whereas the structures that I used here gave me constrained situations in which I could make really clear, open, but free decisions. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of relationship between within the image and between the images, there are, there are clear patterns and connections. Yes. And so at this point, you're now not just thinking about the individual artwork, but you're thinking about relationships between collections of artworks. Exactly, yeah. So you could say there are series. Mm. That's how I was getting into series. And mm -hmm. So I like these drawings from the same period. Um, and these are drawings drawn by hand, but could in principle have been drawn by a computer, you might say. Uh, except that, as you can see, they're not perfect in this way that a computer would do it. Which means that as I drew a line, I was actually making a judgment. Yeah. But what I was doing, but what I had decided was when and in what order I would make each line. So it was kind of like a computer program doing it. Only I was the computer doing well, it. This is very interesting to our mutual friend Esther Rollinson. Yes. I can see then your interest in her process because she yeah. would probably say she's doing something similar. She's she, not a computer. She she but her uh, process is, is algorithmic, if you No, know. no, she would say the same thing. That's right. So, uh, just quickly on these, because I hadn't seen these before. There's a sort of a... reminds me of Sol Lewitt. Yes. In some respects. Okay, so this mm. is quite interesting, because when I was doing these, a friend of mine came to visit me, and he brought me a book of Sol Lewitt ah. drawings, <laughs> and said, Aha, look, Sol Lewitt does this. And what was really interesting in this book was towards the back there was an article by Solowit in which he says, well everyone says to me that my work is just the same as Morellet, Francois Morellet. But, and then he gives the argument of why it's not the same. And of course I then said to my friend, well his argument about his relationship with Morellet is exactly my argument So maybe this my is, relationship. Yeah. With Maybe this is a perpetual thing that people say, oh, your work is like someone else's, and it's the next in line. He says, no, it's yes. different because. Yes. Yeah. I never met uh, Sol Lewitt, but I did meet Morrowway. Mm. And so I have had a discussion yeah. about this uh, passage, if you mm. like. Now, of course, Sol Lewitt famously said that his artworks were the, pr the uh, realization of the system, that yes. the work is all about systems. Yes, yeah, so this and the process, artwork, uh, yeah. yeah, so this process yeah. idea was part of his mm. thinking. And you see that in these drawings too. These are more drawings of the same kind. All of these drawings. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I'm interested in knowing a bit more about here are, again, within the image, the relationship between the parts. Yeah, so, this, so the relationship between the parts is an aspect that Solowit never dealt with. Mm. It was closer to Morley than Solowit, actually, which is the geometric structure. So that... Um, it's very complex, and I don't think we have time for me to describe it in full detail, but just to say that there are characteristics about each of these pieces, right, and, and rules about how they should relate, that mean that this is as close as they could get whilst following my rules. <laughs> yeah. So although you might think this is, you know, couldn't we have moved that in a bit, if you moved it in any closer, it would break one of the rules that I use. So this is very tight, mm. actually. Yeah. Uh, and as with a lot of work in systems art, it really doesn't matter that you can't work out quite what the rules are. But I promise you that you could if you spent enough years 
working yes. on it. Yeah, and I, I say this, exactly the same to people. I don't expect you to work out the rules, but bear uh, with me. There uh, are rules, and if you spent some time, you would be able to get to them. Uh, but yeah. the rules are there in order to help make the work. Mm. They're not there to be discovered yeah. by the viewer. Yeah. They're, they're a device for making something that has this tension, mm. right? which is there because somewhere at the back of the brain there is some kind of half understanding mm. where, which leads to the perception of this tension, which the work I hope mm. has. And then in this piece we have a black and white and a colour yes. as well, and I think that is quite significant because people will look at your work and think, oh, it's all about colour. Yes. You know, certainly, because there is your use of colour. Um, what you're sort of doing here is saying it doesn't have to all be about colour because look, I've got the same image in black and white produced in a slightly different way and colour. Yeah. Mm. Well, we can talk, colour is really important to me, but mm. although that means that sometimes it's easier to use a black and white because colour is too hard. Mm. <laughs> but we can talk about colour a bit later on because mm -hmm. I've cracked a few things with colour later that are not apparent here. Mm. Um, These are similar. Kind yeah. of things. Now, this to me is quite an iconic piece as well. Um, well these, if you look at these two paintings mm. together, if you can step back and get them both. Mm. Yeah, um, the, the, the interesting thing about these two paintings, from a structural point of view rather than an aesthetic point of view, is that actually they, they use pretty much the same sets of rules, but one is the dual of the other. The dual means you turn the rule round. Ah, yes. So instead of so, uh, so one rule might be everyone should stand on their head, and the dual of that will be everyone must stand on their feet. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, without going into the, what the rules actually are here, uh, the fact is that one is the kind of inverse of the other in, at that deep level of the structure. Mm -hmm. So, so the two paintings. So this one, of course, everything is very close and touching. Yeah. Whereas this one, nothing touches. So that might, that maybe is enough to tell you one of those things. Yeah, so one of the rules is it might, they must touch and, and they must touch. Additive maybe going on in a sense. But again, yeah. in this one, the pieces are as close together as they can be, like in those drawings, whilst following these mm -hmm. rules. But these paintings are the same as the drawings in the sense that there is this geometric structure and there's a process structure about how I made it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there are some more paintings here, there are four paintings here, which are similar to those. And you can see they, they're different, but they're using colour in different ways. And here you begin to see that I'm modulating the colour more subtly and more carefully. You're getting closer to what people might think of as your palette, really. Yes. Yeah. So this is like the beginning of me doing and then, um, so actually, just a little bit on these. When were these being made? These would have been in the seventies, later, yeah. slightly later in the seventies. And did you start thinking about them potentially being dynamic works about this time? Uh, well, serious, as you can yeah. see. Uh, and yes, I was thinking about them being mm. dynamic. And perhaps to understand that, we might go round the corner and look at when I mm. started time-based work. Mm -hmm. I'll, not, I'll just leave you around a little bit mm. because here uh, there are two works being shown here which were done in the 80s um, and this is when of course by now we have um, PCs Macintoshes and things right in the 70s we didn't and having personal computers made all kinds of things possible, more accessible. Mm -hmm. right. So when I was doing that series of stuff that we looked at earlier in the 70s, for example, in the 60s, uh, whilst I could have made time-based work, the effort would have been enormous. And I have friends who did it. I guess you would be making animations. Yeah. Every frame and, and, would have been... And what made. people, the people who did, um, made like a three minute animation and they did it, it only took them three months yeah. or something. Right. Uh, well, I didn't really, I could have done that and I had the equipment and everything and I had the ability to do it, but I chose not to. But when we had these machines, 
I could do it in real time. So and also, at the same time, the other important technological advance was videotape. Yes, yeah, there's a definite imprint of VHS in, within this. Well, I think. this was originally. Um, uh, it wasn't VHS. It was ah. some. I don't know. I forget what it was. It was some another another more, tape. more fancy version. Umatic or something. Whatever some, those. Yeah, it was Umatic. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so basically, what I did is I recorded directly from the computer onto Umatic and made. So were you pointing a camera at the computer no, screen? No, no, oh, okay. no. I took, scanned took the data. No, no, yeah. no. I, I had technological. Mm. So I took the data. Uh, RGB mm. data out of the computer and had a way of converting that into mm. a technological way of converting yeah. it and putting it onto video tape. Mm. So I was now making time-based works. So now, instead of a series of works, it was time-based. Mm. But that's not just having a series of works like this one and then this one and then this one. Because once you introduce time, then there's all the issues around like that we're used to in music pace, mm. going faster, slower, and so on and so forth. Right. So it introduced a whole new world, which is why originally I made works with very simple images, because the complexity of time meant So like it's a rhythm, really, is what you yeah, see in these. Yeah, exactly. And also, in these early ones, I didn't use colour because, it, to start with, the screens were so unreliable, <laughs> colour-wise, that I never knew what it would look like. So the only reliable thing mm. to do was use black and white. But then I started to use colour, and if we go here, I'll show you one that I made maybe 10 years later. This is a piece called Nagoya, which is the same kind of thing, except the difference, the difference was that instead of putting it onto videotape, I had a computer which I hid behind the wall, as is here, and put the screen behind this frame. And this piece then goes on forever and is ever changing. There's no looping. So it's a rule based generative colour image. It's called Nagoya because it was in Nagoya when I was in discussion with some people about speed and resources and so on, and I got this view from a Japanese artist that using all this technology didn't mean you had to do all whiz-bang fast blah, 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 stuff, that actually you could do slow things. So this was my start of slow interaction or, and slow mm. time-based work. This didn't, it's not interactive, it's, but it's slow. Um, and so, from those works which could have been thought of a series, we now have time-based work, which is more musical in its mm. model. And also, significantly, this is very reminiscent of shaping form. Which are really... Which are here. Now, so here, if you move yeah. slightly to your left, is probably the first shaping form, I think, which came later. And these pieces are really the same, but I've added interaction. The only difference is that the rules that I use to generate the thing, infinitely changing, now can be changed according to the analysis of images. So that uh, there's a camera, in this case there's a camera just on the screen here, um, and that camera, his data is being fed into a computer and it's doing image analysis on stuff. And that, and the result of what it's seeing is being used to modify the rules. So now the work is changing over long periods of time. So the shaping form pieces are not just interactive as some of the early stuff I did, not in this exhibition, uh, were. Uh, it's interactive in the sense that the work is influenced by what it sees, in quotes, now, and it will be different tomorrow because of what it sees today. So it's both generative and responsive. Yes. Um, and there's an interplay between those two elements. Yes. And yeah. so here we have a few of these of different ages. And now, there's and another... When are we looking at... We're now looking in the 2000s. Okay, in the 2000s now, yeah. But there's another thing that, by now, has happened that I wanted to mention, which is colour. 
because what I had discovered, by the time I did Nagoya in the, in the 90s, I had discovered that, that I could treat colour differently and systematically by um, representing it in the computer by, well, there are various ways of doing it, but for example, hue, saturation, and lightness is one, where you have a representation in the computer which matches perception, not RGB, mm. which is completely useless in this respect. Well, it's very good for computers, but not very good for humans. For humans. But it, so now, what I did from the start, once I started to use colour in this way, I started to use uh, human-oriented representations, and you know very well the work that we were involved in uh, at Loughborough University, so Steve Scrivener led, mm. which was very helpful in terms of un my understanding of the possibilities here. And what this meant was that whereas earlier I was using systems to organise like where the lines were and what shapes there were, I could now use these systems to organize the colors. So now the colors, instead of being like, um, just like, oh, I think I'll have a blue here and a red there, were subtly selective and could be modified. So I could say, well, I want these two colors next to one another, but I want to just to make, for example, the saturation levels exactly the same, mm. or to make this one slightly more saturated or less or something. And so, and over time, the rules could change one or other of those characteristics. So the work could, for example, become slowly more saturated, something like that. So for example, I did a piece in the late um, 80s, actually. So this was probably the very first piece I did like this, shown in Rotterdam, which ran all day. And the saturation levels changed, like morning, oh, okay. midday, yeah. and night. Right. So the colors changed and the, it was generative and changing all the time like all the other stuff but the saturation levels shifted to kind of match the time of day hmm. and when was that piece that was 89 89 okay and so, um, yeah yeah so here are the, some of these pieces I think another thing that of course jumps out about these is that at a time when people would often try and show off that they were using the latest fanciest computer and screen you were making these look as close to artworks Yes, as possible. to hide all that yeah. stuff, yes. Yeah. And that was important to me because I wanted to concentrate on the colour and the form and the time mm. and not on the technology. Mm. Maybe if we move along just to here, I'll, then a more recent shaping mm. form is like this one, where I'm now, in fact, on the film, the colours are getting so subtle yeah. that it may hardly show up. I can, yeah, so we can now. But what you have here is really, compared to how you started using screens, something that looks, well, it looks like it could be a painted image from the front. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And this is doing all the things that mm. we talked about. And at the same time as doing these, I'm making paintings. There's a, four of them here. So here we have a, a back they're, again they're to a, like a still sequence. Screens. Yeah. Um, so that, if you like, the, the shaping forms are informing mm. the paintings. Yeah. But what I'm actually doing is printing screen images and then looking very carefully at the colours and sometimes I'm using acrylic paints to bring out a mm. colour a bit or soften it down or something. Mm. Um, I think maybe let's have a look at the one just round the corner here. here. Yeah. Oh, there's one here. Oh, yeah. That, this was an earlier one. And again, how are these produced? Yeah, these, these are. These were basically screen grabs, mm. printed and then painted. Yeah. And you are painting them? I'm painting yeah. them. Yeah. But then the ones you were thinking of here, these mm. are just printed directly. So onto aluminium. And what I think happened to me, enable me to do these is that by printing onto canvas and modifying, I was really learning about the colour uh, and going back into the programmes and modifying how the programmes worked. Mm. Right? So that after a while, a few of these iterations, I was doing less painting mm. because the colours were coming out 
more as I really wanted until I got these ones, yeah. which are just directly printed and not modified by hand at all. And I think these, when, when did you produce these? these? Were this year. This year. And this, to me, it, we're so close now to having the potential merger of the colour fidelity of the digital screen and uh, yes. the quality of the print. Yes. So I guess the next logical step would be to have great big images like this that are actually digital screens with no visible computer, lovely reflective colours. Um, and in fact, the, the screen that we have over here is manufactured as a block for a video wall. Mm. So one possibility is to build a video wall of those. Yeah. Of course, you get a small black line in it which could be seen to maybe be like this line yeah there. so it's maybe it could be acceptable but probably in the not too distant future that will disappear anyway yeah and we, these will be digital screens or yeah. they may be a, exactly. we may not even actually have a distinction and, and between what digital i've always tried to do is i've always tried to do my work building towards the future mm -hmm. so i was trying to make interactive art when we had computers that had to fit in rooms like this and it was ridiculous mm -hmm. really but you know we could get the spirit of it and the concept of it and I still do the same and I'm still kind of waiting for the technology yeah great I think that is a pretty good look around thank you very much thank you